Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am Maxwell Ivy, and welcoming you to an episode of Hearsay Shorts, where I'm going to be speaking with Mariela Paulino, who is the Senior Advocacy and Social Media Manager for Audioi. She is also an entrepreneur and a public speaker. And so, Mariela, I'm so happy to be able to interview us, be able to interview you for my very first posting duties on here say short so thank you whoopee i just did a happy dance very very excited to be here with you today max so hi everyone my name is maria paulino i am a hispanic woman i have shoulder on my curly hair i am wearing a black shirt with the rei logo and i'm currently in my home office with artwork and pictures behind me let's go ahead and get this party started um max Right. Thanks for reminding me about the audio description. I am a Caucasian male with medium length brown curly hair, brown eyes, wearing a white button down shirt with black tie, recording from my bedroom. And so, Mariella, why don't uh, you start by telling people a little bit more about you and then we'll go from there. Love it. Um, so, I am someone with a hearing disability. I use something that's called a cochlear implant. It is a device that allows me to hear. Um, over the course of my career, I've been in a range of industries ranging from technology, higher education, as he pointed out, entrepreneurship. I have my own venture, Profit Hearing which I started at the height of the COVID pandemic as I was struggling with people wearing masks, which hindered my ability to live breathe and caused a lot of dependency on other people, a challenge that I never really experienced before. And from there, I started my journey documenting my life as someone with a human disability, all the tricks that I came up with. And right now, I am working as audio eye as the CEO of the Social Media Marketing Manager is quite a title. And I get to create content and meet and connect and tell the stories of people with disabilities as we create a more accessible internet. So very excited to be here. Well, thank you. It's a very impressive background. And uh, I know from speaking with you before that your uh, hearing was uh, taken away from you by having meningitis. I was wondering if you could tell me about what that is and what the effects are. Um, I came to this country in 1987. I was about seven years old. And a few months after arriving to New York City, um, I contracted bacterial meningitis. Bacterial meningitis is essentially around your brain. You have something called the meningitis. It's basically the membrane that um, protects your brain. And so what happens with bacterial meningitis is um, your meningitis kind of like swells up as the bacteria tries to attack your brain. In about 10 people that get bacterial meningitis with the aggressiveness that I had about only three people survive, and then those three should end up with some sort of mental damage or they lose their limbs. I'm very lucky I have all ten. Um, unfortunately, the bacterial meningitis made me deaf in both ears, and very soon after losing my hearing, my family made the decision to implant me on one ear with the cochlear implant. So how the cochlear implant works is in your ear, you have a cochlea, and the cochlea is like a snail shell. It's like a circle, and then in that cochlea, you have um, hairs that kind of like dance around when you hear. And so all of those hairs in my cochlea were destroyed. What the cochlear implant does is a magnet with a cord, and that cord goes inside the cochlea, replacing the hair cells that were destroyed as a result of the meningitis. I have another magnet outside. I can show you. But it's not, it, uh, uh, the magnet that's outside is the magnet that's inside, creating artificial sound and allowing me to hear and communicate. A bit short at that person out here. 
Okay, I appreciate you not only uh, explaining that, but also letting people see it and better understand it. So maybe they won't be afraid of this if they run into someone else in their life or in their daily activities that depends on a cochlear implant like you do. So now I understand that your mother actually got you started in the area of advocacy from an early age. And I would love to hear more about what that was like uh, growing up and her influence on your becoming an accessibility advocate. I, I do have a really great story on that. So one of the things that my family really believes in is that accessibility and inclusion really begins in the home. So back in the day, before Spotify, before YouTube, you know, you would listen to the radio. And what would happen is that when I was learning how to hear again with my cochlear implant, because it is a process of learning how to hear again, we would have um, music playing in the radio. And my sister and my mom would sing along when a song came on and I was really struggling and having a hard time with following along to the song and the music. And what my mom would do is she would take a cassette player and a song came on the video. But my, like one of my favorite songs from my childhood is Selena, Beauty Beauty Bum Bum. And what she would do is she would take the cassette player when the song played on the video before the song. And then she would rewind, play, write. And she and my sister would write the song by hand. And then I would listen to the song again and again and again, following along with the lyrics. And so the next time the song came on the radio, I would pull out my little like lyrics and I would sing along. And that was the level of accessibility I came to expect in the home. And that was the level of accessibility I came to expect in the classroom. And that's the same level of accessibility I came to expect in the workplace. And so that really set me up for life. Because I was included at home, I came to expect to be included in every other aspect of my life. So accessibility is so crucial in family dynamics. I mean, you have a family that is willing to accommodate you. It can be a really, really powerful thing that sets you up for the rest of your life. Right. And the part about that I especially love that we need to emphasize is expectation. That it is uh, that we can, we can and should expect accessibility and inclusion at home, in school, and in the workplace. So thanks for making that so clear because I'm not sure that a lot of people with a disability uh, actually have that understanding deep inside them like you do. Uh, now, I understand that um, later in life, you had an incident that made you uh, understand the challenges of having the hearing disability even more so. And that led you to your education, to your work as a public speaker. Could you share that with us? Absolutely. So um, after I graduated from college, I wanted to go out and live my best life and wanted to live independently. And I moved out to Washington, D.C., Virginia, the DMV. And um, one day I was just driving either somewhere or coming from somewhere. Doesn't matter. The thing is, I was running late, as usual. And um, what ended up happening was that I was speeding on the highway. I was actually speeding in Virginia, which is the worst place for you to speak because you will get pulled over in Virginia, like, no doubt about it. And so this was my first time getting pulled over. And so I had practiced this with my mom, but I just put my hands at three and nine and then made it. This was also during the height of the Black Lives Matter movement. And um, as the police officer stopped me, um, I pulled over to the side of the road and he was giving me commands. These commands to me sounded like, oh, blah, 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 blah. I could not make out what he was saying. So I just waited 
my hands on the steering wheel and see a close up my car. I looked in the rear view mirror and I see, I said, it's his car. His hand was on the holster. Um, but he came up to me and he said, and I just turned around and I showed him my hearing equipment. And I said, officer, I'm really sorry. I cannot understand what you were saying. And so the officer, um, when I when I told him I had a hearing disability, the situation just very quickly diffused. And um, she said, I had been giving you commands to turn off your vehicle. And, you know, at the end of it all, with this dashing smile, she just decided to let me um, for the warning. But um, before she let me go, I said, officer, do you have any accommodations for how I can, you know, facilitate communication at night? His response was, there's not a problem. Figure it out. And I was like, okay, not, not necessarily the expectation that I had. But I did um, set out to figure it out. And I decided to pursue my master's degree in communication. So I just found my capstone was actually studying how police officers interact with people with hearing disabilities. And what I found is that a police officer will scan the back of your vehicle for about six seconds to figure out who you are. Are you a National Life Association member? Are you a teacher? Are you a doctor? If you're speeding, why are you speaking? All these assumptions that are, you are made within six seconds. And from there, I came up with the idea of maybe I should just have a sticker in the back of my car that says death driver. And from there, I realized that um, the challenges that I was having that I thought were personal were actual, actually systemic and communal. And from there, the idea of the share was born really as a way of me communicating some of the challenges um, and solutions that I was coming up with as someone with a hearing disability. Right. So a couple of things there that are important. One, that you were told to come up with your own solution, which is fairly common. Uh, many times I tell potential employers that one of the, the assets they will get by hiring someone with, with a disability is they will generally get somebody who is a problem solver because they've had to do it in their own lives. Yeah, very, very often. Um the challenges that we think are personal, that is only us that are experiencing them. The challenges that we feel are personal shortcoming can sometimes end up being systemic challenges, systemic barriers. And it is very often when we talk about these things with others that we realize, hold up. I'm not the only person having this challenge. And it can be a really powerful thing um, when we really build community around ourselves to make our lives better. Okay, one last subject I want to get to before we're through is I understand you recently became a mom and I want to congratulate you on that. And I would love it if you would share some of the fears you had around becoming a mother who has a hearing disability and then also what if anything from becoming a parent has changed or affected your opinion about the outlook for the future of accessibility for people with disabilities and inclusion? You just said um, becoming a mom, but I just did a, a little happy dance there. Um, so for me, I was always filled with a lot of anxiety around motherhood. Um, as it intersected with my identity as someone with a hearing disability. I have had a lot of anxiety and a lot of fears. What if I didn't hear the baby in the middle of the night? What if we go out somewhere and something happens and then I end up being a terrible mom because I didn't hear my baby? Um, and one of the most empowering things that has happened to me is that I have really just gone out there and tried to find my people, tried to find community, tried to find solutions to the problems I've had because I am not the first woman with a disability that has embarked on motherhood who has a hearing disability, nor will I be the last. And it had been such an 
empowering journey to be able to meet other people with disabilities who are parents because I have been given access to an to a wealth of knowledge. And it has been so empowering because I'm doing things like we are doing our first mommy and me swim class in about a week. This in the in the list of things that gives me anxiety is water and children. Because when I am near the water, I have to take off my hearing equipment because my hearing equipment is not waterproof. But I also have talked to other moms who have done money and me swimming classes. And they talked about things that they've done, like talking to the instructor before the swimming class, explaining your disability, coming up with solutions, like coming up with a system, um, like lip reading or having the instructor give you the instructions while you have your hearing on. Um, and now I don't have an anxiety about this at all. I'm actually really, really, really excited to take this course and to use all of the tools and resources that I, I collected. And all of this ties to the excitement that I have about the future of accessibility because there are so many tools in this year, 2024, to make accessibility more attainable. I have an alarm clock that wakes me up when my baby is crying. I mean, like the pillow vibrates when the baby is crying. I have tools and services that have collect connected me to the fire and police department in case of an emergency in, in my home. I have these uh, apps that I can use to help me uh, keep track of my baby's pooping schedule on my phone, like all these things that really have made me feel, you know, really empowered. Like I have all the tools that I that I need to be successful to be a mom. And that is so excite exciting for me because I feel like just a generation ago these things did not exist for for parents with disabilities. And now you just have a wealth of information and it's just the way to get better. Um so I'm really excited about embarking on this journey and sharing everything that I'm learning with others. Right. I, I especially appreciate you sharing some of those hacks for the the smaller, you know, more common moments of, of your day, because I'm sure there are lots of people out there who don't have a disability or don't know somebody with a disability who wonder about things like that. And you just answered four or five really awkward questions for a lot of people in about a minute there. So... I thought that was really cool, and I, I appreciate you coming and sharing so openly on Hearsay Shorts. And I'm wondering if you might have one or two final words for the audience. Absolutely. What I always say um, when it comes to accessibility is do the best you can where you are with what you have. It is not so much about seeking perfection. It's truly about doing the most with what you have where you are. If you are a hiring manager, make sure that you're hiring people with disabilities, that you are creating with people with disabilities. If you're a marketing professional, include all text in your images. If you are a video designer, make sure that you are doing video discussion on your videos. It doesn't matter what your role is in your organization or whatever it is that you do in life, you have the power to create a more accessible future for all of us. So really own it, tap into that, and try to focus just the bare minimum when it comes to accessibility, because once you start doing it, it, it will just become a, a part of your life. So do the best you can where you are with what you have when it comes to accessibility. That is my closing message to anyone listening to this. All right. Those are some wonderful bits of advice for us to close on. And thank you so much for being my guest on Hearsay Shorts. Very excited to be here and so excited for the upcoming stories. Until next time, Ash. Hearsay Shorts is produced by Sojin Wright, Mike Barton, Mariella Paulino, Missy Jensen, and Max Ivy. 
and is edited by Alex Dorier. If you enjoyed the podcast and don't want to miss any future episodes, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time.